Hello, welcome to part two of the World Cup Fantasy Preview from uh, the FPL Scope podcast. I am Matthias, one of your hosts, and uh, with me I have Kevin. This is the third time we're trying to record the rules of the game. So, uh, Kevin, are you excited to finally get this recording right and finally have the actual rules be in place? Yeah, I'd like to uh, take the opportunity to say, and the FPL, go to hell. Uh, but uh, to be completely honest, well done on figuring out the rules because now, as we're about to talk and uh, look at, the rules have been updated finally. All the players that have been injured and all that type of stuff and all the correct selections have been added to. So it seems like we can finally sit down, talk about things, and just move on with our lives. Yeah. We'll get to Let's Talk FPL, a.k.a. Andy, in just a minute. But before that, we'll just go through the general rules, which are pretty much the same, except for one little difference when it comes to midfielders. But we'll get to that later. First, we're going to look at the scoring for all the players. I'm just going to quickly go through them. I've done this two times already with recordings that we haven't used. So just going to go pretty quickly. Uh, it's pretty similar to FPL. There are a couple of differences. I'll make note of the differences whenever I see them. Firstly, appearances, you get one point for 60 minutes or more played. You don't get a point if you just get subbed on, subbed on and play 30 minutes. That's zero points in terms of appearances. You'd have to score or assist or something to get more points. Speaking of assists, you get three points for every assist, just like in FPL. Yellow card, red cards, own goals is the same as FPL. One, minus one for yellow cards, minus two for red cards, minus two for own goals. And the difference here is winning a penalty. You get two points regardless if the penalty is scored or not. In FPL, you only get an assist point if the penalty is converted after you get the penalty. So that also, on top of just getting the points, you can also win a penalty and then score the penalty for, well, for the amount of points you get. If you're a striker, you get five points for scoring a goal and two points for winning the penalty. So if Kane, Harry Kane, for example, wins a penalty and scores it, he's going to get seven points from that, which is uh, pretty massive. And then conceding a penalty, this is also a difference from FPL. There's no penalty for conceding a penalty in uh, FPL, but in this game, you get minus one point if you concede a penalty. We go on to the goalkeepers. You get five clean sheet points compared to four clean sheet points in uh, FPL, but you have to play 70 minutes or more if you're a goalkeeper, but most starting goalkeepers will play 70 plus anyway because starting goalkeepers don't usually get subbed off. Um, there's another difference when it comes to goals conceded. FPL, you get minus one point for every two goals conceded. Here you get minus one point for every goal conceded after the first one. So if you lose 5-0, you get minus four points on your goalkeeper. Uh, then again, goalkeepers can make up for this if they score a goal. That's a massive plus nine points. But it should be noted that not a single goalkeeper in the history of the World Cup have scored a single goal. So maybe we'll make history for the first time in 92 years, but ever since 1930, there hasn't been a single goalkeeper goal. Even in the under-20s, under-17s, I think there's only been two goalkeeper goals. One of them was a penalty. Uh, Farinas, who plays for... He plays in France. I can't remember exactly which team he plays for. Venezuelan goalkeeper. He scored a penalty in under-20s, and some other players scored in under-17s or something. So goalkeeper goals are really rare. You can't account for them. You know, Allison scored for Liverpool a couple seasons back, but you can't really look at his XG and predict that he's going to score in the World Cup. That's not how it works. Uh, so goal scored is just a nice little fun thing if it happens, finally. But you can get points for penalties saved. That is true for goalkeepers more so than uh, any other position. You can't save a penalty unless you're a goalkeeper, of course. So if you save a penalty, that's plus three points. And also you get one point one point for every three saves so if you get nine saves you get three points and so forth just like in fpl moving on to the defenders again you get five points for clean sheets only with the defenders you only have to play 60 minutes or more the goalkeepers are 70 minutes or more i don't know why they made that distinction but that's that's how the rules are same as with the goalkeepers for the defenders every well the first goal conceded is zero points you don't get the clean sheet the clean sheet is wiped out but then every additional goal conceded is minus one and for defenders you get plus seven for goal scored which is uh, more than an fpl where you get six points so scoring goals is more important than assists for defenders in this compared to fpl uh, in fpl you also get bonus points which are not part of this game you don't get any bonus points uh, so that makes assists even less valuable because assists are usually the difference between 
getting three and zero bonus points in FPL, but there are no bonus points here, so assists are only the three points in uh, in this game. Moving onwards to the midfielders and forwards, you get a clean sheet point for uh, midfielders if they play 60 minutes or more. Every goal scored is five points, just like in FPL. And also there's another category, which is every three tackles is plus one. The rules used to say that every two key passes you get a plus one as well, but they've removed this since they updated the rules today, uh, Friday. We're recording on Friday. So we don't have to take key passes into consideration, really. And I think we both agree that you don't really have to take tackles into consideration either. It's mostly just a stat to make defensive midfielders gain more points. So, I mean... There are some defensive midfielders that will score in this uh, World Cup, I'm sure. So maybe they get nine tackles on top of that and get three points on top of the goal scored and you get a massive score, but it's very unlikely. So I wouldn't be targeting defensive midfielders. I don't know about you, Kevin. Are you looking at any defensive midfielders with this rule? I mean, no. <laughs> I mean, that, that's that's simple. Easy. Yeah, I mean, there's. I genuinely don't feel that um, the stat or the bonus point... Uh, sort of system of getting three tackles is worth you know taking someone of a similar price who's an attacking mid or a left wigger or left mid and you'd pick a cdm because of this one little stat no no chance so i'd say unless they're like a penalty taker or something like that or they're known for go- their goal scoring uh for example if italy had made the world cup her would have been pretty decent choice but even he doesn't get that many tackles in because he's not really good midfielder to begin with so uh yeah yeah i mean you have someone like uh, bruno grimarash from newcastle who's also he can put a tackle in and he can score sometimes mm-hmm. so but he's more of like an all-round midfielder uh, it's not strictly a defensive midfielder i think uh yeah but yeah anyways you didn't you shouldn't really take into account defensive midfielders i think someone guessed how much was he again Price? seven or yeah seven million seven million which is quite a hefty price but you never know what someone gets uh, he's he's a really good player obviously he's not gonna yeah, of course he's probably not gonna get you that many fantasy points but he has had a couple of games for napoli where he scored or scored twice even so that's my uh, my uh, prediction he's gonna get two goals in uh, one of the matches now I don't think someone guess that will be a, a viable option and i don't think any other defensive midfielders like kevin said unless they take penalties or something or our known goal scorers will be good options, even with this extra bonus points for every three tackles. When it comes to forwards, it's the same. You get five plus points, five points for scoring a goal, which is one more than you get in FPL. So, yeah, being a striker is more lucrative in uh, Fantasy World Cup than it is in FPL. On top of the goal scored, you also get one point for every two shots on target. Um, usually players get well two shots on target is pretty high per game actually Um, you'd be really lucky to get four and six shots on target is pretty much unheard of it it happens but it's so rare that you shouldn't really take it into account that much it might be a bit of a difference in the world cup where you have more of a disparity between the teams if you have for example spain against costa rica they might get well 10 shots on target so maybe you're lucky and one of the players ferran torres for example gets six shots on target and you get three points from that but again you shouldn't really take that into account i don't know about you kevin are you more interested in for example harry kane who takes a lot of shots or cristiano ronaldo takes a lot of shots because of this rule or no No. (laughs) like i i would have those players because they score i couldn't care less uh with shots on target especially with cristiano ronaldo with his current career trajectory and the trajectory of his shots lately yeah, nothing seems to be on target for him as of late. Yeah. So that's it for the general scoring rules. So we'll go on to the more well, confusing sort of rules, which also differ a bit from uh, FPL. So obviously in uh, the World Cup, you will have different matches per day. You have each match day, you have four different days that the matches are played on. Or in the match day one, you have five different days because Qatar Ecuador is on the Sunday. Uh, as a standalone match but regularly you have two we have four separate sections of matches um you have group a and b play together group c and d group uh e and f and group g and h play together we'll look more into that later but 
uh, basically there's a difference between unlocked and locked players in this in this game so a player is unlocked until his team uh, plays a match and then it becomes locked for that game or match day so for example um, Ener Valencia plays for Ecuador he's gonna be their captain and most likely their best potential goal scorer against Qatar on Sunday and you can swap him out until the match starts on Sunday. So if you get the lineup and Ener Valencia for some reason is not in the lineup, you can swap him out even even though it's an hour before. You know, in FPL, you have a deadline uh, an hour and a half before, but that's not the case in, in this game. The deadline is when the game starts uh, for your player to be locked or unlocked. But as soon as the player plays, he's uh, locked, which means that you can't uh, transfer him out. Uh, if you transfer him out while he's locked, it's basically going to be effective. The transfer is going to be effective for match day two and not match day one. But unlocked players, you can swap out. Uh, and well, we get to the transfers pretty soon. We can actually, well, we'll, we'll look at that pretty sa- pretty soon. Um, does this make sense for you, Kevin? The locked and unlocked players. You have anything yeah, anything bad? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think it's. Um... I was going to say pretty straightforward, but it wasn't until uh, specifically specified and et cetera. But essentially, yeah, it, it makes sense. It's just the question of it makes strategy so much more difficult compared to, you know, regular Premier League where you know that when a deadline happens and all this type of stuff, that's it, you're done. But mm-hmm. here you're going to be so confused, wondering you might even save money because you want to do a certain transfer and all this type of stuff. And that in itself could make you lose out on points because you had, if you hadn't done that, you might have had a more expensive option that does do better and all, all this type of stuff. So I think it's it's their way of trying to make it fair in the sense of, you know, there's games being played at so many different random hours and all this type of stuff. Um, so I get it, but I also see how this is going to be an added headache for people in terms of fantasy decisions. Yeah, you definitely have to be more engaged uh, during the match day, as it's called. It's not called game week, it's called match day. You have to be more engaged during the match day and make changes as the matches happen and as you get lineups and all that stuff so Mm -hmm. we'll look more into that pretty soon when it comes to substitutions and transfers um but first i'm going to take a look at captaincy this is something i was a bit confused about i really shouldn't have been because the captaincy rules are the same as they were in uh well pretty much every champions league fantasy game and also from judge from what i remember the euros fantasy game was the same Basically, you can change, as as long as your captain hasn't played, you can change an unlimited amount of times your captain. Uh, but once your captain has played, you can only change one time. So the example that Andy made was that you can captain Kane as the 1 p.m. match on Monday. And then if Kane gets two points or something and you want to swap him out, then you can switch your captaincy to, well, in Andy's example, it's Dumfries. But in our example, if, if I had Kane as captain and he blanked, basically... I'd probably switch his captaincy to Messi and just hope that Messi scores against uh, Saudi Arabia. But after I've done the Kane to Messi sw- uh, swap of captaincy, I had no, I'd have no chance to swap the captaincy again. So I'd be stuck with Messi as captain, which wouldn't be the worst against Saudi Arabia. But if he blanks against Saudi Arabia or gets one goal only, there might be players after him that score more points. So just keep that in mind. You can only change your captain once if your captain has played already. Um, So that's it for captaincy, really. We'll move on to transfers. Again, this is kind of more confusing. I know it says easy in the tagline because there was uh, we had a different slide previously before the clarifications came in. But basically, this is the rules from the official site. Uh, It tells you how many transfers you have before and during each match day, I suppose. So it says unlimited transfers before the tournament starts. So before the first match between Ecuador and uh, Qatar on Saturday or Sunday, I mean, uh, you have an unlimited amount of transfers. You can swap your whole team uh, all the way through. But once uh, that match starts and match day one starts, you have two transfers. And then for match day two, you also have two transfers. And match day three, you have two transfers before you get an unlimited amount of transfers again before the knockout stage. The thing I'm still a bit confused about is 
if you use your transfers during match day one, is does that affect your transfers for match day one only, or is, does that affect your transfers for match day two as well? So you you can actually roll a transfer if you use only one transfer, you get three transfers in the next match day. So I figure this is how I interpret the rules so far. If you use one transfer during match day one and you don't use the other one, you'll get three transfers for match day two, pretty much. And same goes for match day two. If you only use well two of those transfers, two of those three transfers in match day two, you'll get three transfers for match day three. That's how I understand it, at least. But after the group stage and you get unlimited when you get unlimited transfer for the round of 16 well before the round of 16 uh, then you get four transfers during the round of 16 so within the round of 16 if you see someone who's not in the lineup that you have in your team you can swap him out use one of your four transfers and then once again i assume the the one transfer if you have transfers uh left after round of 16 if you've used three of your four transfers that will roll over to the quarterfinals where normally you'd get five transfers but if you roll over transfer you get six and the same for semifinals you have five transfers unless you roll over a transfer and then in the final slash third place um, final you get six transfers before that match as well that's quite a lot of transfers actually for the the final because the semifinal teams and the final and once final teams will be the same so you get six transfers to to switch up your team. So I guess if there's some kind of Cinderella team that makes it to the semifinals, you can swap from the team that beat them in the semifinals to the team that face them in the bronze finals, for example. So like if, let's say, Costa Rica, for, <laughs> for some reason, makes it to the semifinals and they play France in the semifinals, you can load up on French players for the semifinals and then they win 5-0 over Costa Rica. And then in the bronze finals, Costa Rica play well, Brazil, for example. Then you can load up on Brazil players against Costa Rica. So I guess that's how you use the six transfers in the final matchup. But if there are four pretty good teams, six transfers seems like quite a lot. But I don't know. Do you have any thoughts when it comes to transfers? Does it make sense to you? What is your interpretation of the rules, Kevin? Yeah, I mean, I think the uh, the way you interpret the rules with the or the transfers being rolled over is the way I would interpret it too. I think in terms of everything else, it's pretty clear cut. I think it's just to give everyone a chance to fix their teams because we're going to have teams that we're going to load up on who could shockingly go out. You know, in the case of last time out with France, Switzerland in the Euros, everyone loaded up on Kylian Mbappe and all this type of stuff. And then they were the ones who got knocked out. So, yeah, I think it's just the way of it balancing instead of just giving you um, unlimited transfers after each round. It just increasingly gives you more and more. If you're good at the game anyways, you're going to be loading up on the team and players that will more most likely win anyways. But I think this is just to give you that freedom to also bail you out if you went like, you know what, I'm going to I'm gonna try Van Dyke against uh, Argentina or something like that. And then it completely fails on you you can just quickly transfer them out so yeah i think it, it is quite generous too i think especially if you rolled over one from the semi-final you have seven transfers for the final and third place <laughs> technically so uh yeah so i think it's uh i think it's a fair way of uh doing it and also um i think um yeah I, otherwise it'd be a bit harsh they always give even last time out with the world cup they gave like a crazy amount of uh, transfers and also allocations for players from the same team as well increased. So, you know, when you begin, it's three, but in most fantasy things, you'd only be able to uh, keep like, well, in league fantasies, you're only allowed to have three from each team, but in knockout things like this, it increases, it becomes from three to four, four to five, and then from the fi- from I think it's from the semifinal or, or maybe only the final, if you wanted to, you can field 11 of just the team, you know, like let's say Argentina make it to final, you just field an Argentinian side if you want to. Whilst I think that's a very, uh, it's a risky move. Uh, it can work out. It did for you a couple of years ago when you just fielded basically Belgian players uh, against, was it England or? Yeah. yeah and uh, yeah. 
they end up uh, crushing them and kept the clean sheet. So you just had clean sheets across the board and everything like that. Yeah. So according to the official rules, you have max eight players per nation in the final and bronze okay. final. So you can pretty much load up on a squad. You just have to okay. pick eight out of the 11 players <laughs> starting for in the final Fair if, if you want to. But you should probably spread it for between the bronze final and the final. Usually, yeah, exactly. usually, usually the bronze final is more high scoring than the final anyway. So 100%. I'd probably load up on the bronze final match and then just have a couple other spicy picks from the final. Yep. But speaking of the story you told about uh, me loading up on, I think it was Belgium, uh, playing the bronze final against England. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, that seems correct. Belgium lost to France and uh, England lost to Croatia. Basically, yeah. that was in uh, Euros fantasy. And throughout the whole tournament, I had a captaincy curse. Whoever I captained blanked pretty much. So I used that to my advantage in the bronze final where I captained Kane who blanked. And then I loaded up on all the defenders from Belgium who got clean sheet points <laughs> against England because uh, Kane, who's pretty much England's only goal scorer, uh, didn't score so that's that story uh, thanks for reminding me that's how i beat you in euro fantasy so uh, always nice to refresh my memory on that mm -hmm. but just uh, going through the the maximum amount of players we don't have that on the screen but i can just go through it quickly now in the group stage you have max three players per nation and then round of 16 it increases to four quarterfinals five semifinals six and then final you have eight players maximum per nation so those are the rules for that I think that's it for the transfer rules. Uh, it's just mm -hmm. a matter of, uh, yeah, as I understand it, you have two transfers between the start of match day one and the start of match day two. And then you have two transfers between the start of match day two and the start of match day three. And then you have two transfers between the start of match day three and match day three ending. That's how I understand it. Um, moving on, we go to the boosters, which have not been changed since the rules were updated. Uh, it's still the same, but we're going to go through them uh, for you. We did that in a previous recording, but we'll go through it again um, for a recording that will be published. So uh, we have the standard wildcard, which is the same sort of as in uh, Fancy Premier League, but I'll get to how it's a bit different in this game still. Uh, wildcard, if you don't know, if you haven't played FPL uh, even, uh, it means you can switch out your whole team basically. If with You have unlimited transfers to swap out your whole team. And I'll go more into detail about how that can affect this game um, pretty soon. But first, we're going to go to the other boosters. The first one is 12th man, which is basically a way of you putting in a player that you don't have into your squad. You have an unlimited amount of budget to put in this player, so you can pick the most expensive player, Mbappe. Plenty of people will use Mbappe as the 12th man in uh, match day one, because he has an easy match in the first match day against Australia. And then they play Denmark, which is a tougher match match day two so having having him as your 12th man makes a lot of sense for match day one um so he's basically just another guy you have in your squad the only thing you have to note with uh the 12th man is that you can't captain him so that's why personally i'm a bit unsure if i'm gonna have mbappe as a captain or as a 12th man or if i should have him in my regular squad and captain him so that's something you can uh, you can well ponder really so that's the 12th man um kevin well we, we'll get to the use of the 12th man uh, pretty soon uh kevin is going to speak more about that when we come to his team because he's going to use that chip in the first match day uh, then we also have a uh, power captain which basically is the game selecting the highest scoring player on your team uh, to be your captain for you you don't have to, have to think about who to captain you can just use the power captain chip and then whoever scores the most points for your team whether it's starting or on the bench automatically becomes the captain and gets a lot of points um but yeah uh do you have any strategies for these boosters kevin that you would like to share yeah i mean in terms of um the wild card i think using it early is good i think using most of these are good uh, early simply because the player pool is much bigger. There are more one-sided matches. You already know the matches that are going to happen. And uh, basically, it's usually in the group stages where you have a lot of these mega high-scoring games anyways. Um, I feel that when it comes to the playoff time, 
you know, you got the matches going to extra time and penalties and et cetera. Here, you know, it's 90 minutes. We need to get the win. And uh, I think for most of these things, you can use them early. I think the wild card is the one that maybe you can hold out. But even there, everything's so generous in terms of the transfers that you could wild card after a terrible game week, we, you know, or match day one and then just reset your team and be like, okay, well, this guy scored, that guy scored, this defender's great, that defender's great. So, yeah, I think wild card early, 12th man, probably early as well, You're because I'm, early. I'm, I'm, I'm using it early. Uh, but that could be saved because you, can, you could easily 12th man a player that uh, you wouldn't have picked otherwise in the knockout stages. If there's like an like a random match that you're like, oh, this one player I think could do really well in this game, you could save it. But again, I'm I'm using it straight away. Power captain is one of those that you could essentially wait until later. But I feel like I'm going to use that like game week three, maybe or even round of round of sixteen. Like somewhere where I can see that there are obvious candidates for that. And also, again, it's all about the player pool and of the selection of players that you can have. Power captain makes sense to do in the group stages. All of these sound like they're sound for the early game. Yeah. I, I know at least a way you can make a case for all of them in the group stage. I am personally probably not going to do that, but if you want to blow your whole load language okay uh, in the group stage and just have a just start off uh, on a high uh, really and make you more engaged really as well if you get a lot of points in the group stages you'll be more engaged in the knockout stages because you'll have a bigger chance to win your mini league uh, but yeah pretty much i think if you want to use all three, three boosters in um, the group stage i would like heaven would use the 12th man in the first uh, match day Someone like Mbappe makes sense um, if you if you don't have him in your squad, uh, if you don't want to captain him, if you just want to have him as an extra man, it makes sense for Mbappe or someone like Neymar, who is also playing on the final day. So using him as captain is more like up in the air. By that, by that point, you probably have captained Messi and switched to the burn if Messi didn't score against Saudi Arabia. But as we both know, Messi will score a hat-trick at least against Saudi Arabia. So that's going to be your best captain game match day one anyway. So you don't really need the Mbappe to be the, your, cap- your captain. Anyways, so, <laughs> um, so yeah, you can use 12 men in uh, the first match day. And then when it comes to the wild card, this is where I'll explain a bit more on the wild card. So apparently this is what uh, Let's Talk FL, aka Andy, um, said earlier today. Or I'll try to... Re- or make a case for earlier today is that you can use your wild card before match day two and just completely switch out your whole squad for match day one you can swap out and well if you have Mbappe you can swap him out because if he's Denmark you can swap out other players with difficult matches I think Spain and Germany play each other in match day two if I'm not mistaken we'll see that in a minute um, but yeah you can swap out your whole team basically and then you'll have unlimited transfers throughout the match day so even further in the match day, like after the first few matches uh, have been played, you can still do unlimited transfers. Um, so what you can do there is that after all of your players have played, basically, or pretty much before the final final match in uh, match day one, which is Brazil against Serbia, you can swap out your whole team and you still get the points from those players in the match day, but you can swap out the whole team and have a completely new team for match day three. So using your wildcard before match day two, you can have a completely new team for match day two and then have a completely new team for match day three as well. And then in match day three, you can use power captain because match day three is sometimes the more, well, harder to predict fixtures because some teams are already through. So selecting your captain is more of a, well, crapshoot, if I (laughs) can use that word. So for example, like you'd want to captain Messi probably, but he potentially might start because Argentina might be through already. So you would have used one of your two captain choices already uh, if you don't use power captain. So it makes more sense for me to use power captain in uh, match day three where you just get the best player uh, selected and then you can select a lot of different players using your wildcard in match day two. So 
that's my case for using all three boosters in the group stage. Personally, I might save like the wild card is also quite handy in the round or in the for the quarterfinals. You can just basically have unlimited transfers for a round of sixteen your round of sixteen team, and then you can use your your wild card for the quarterfinals. So you can target all the best players for round of sixteen and swap out your whole team for uh, the quarterfinals, uh, and then. You can use the, you can use the same tactic here at the end of the quarterfinals when you see the teams that go through or go out. You can swap out those players, the players that are gone out. Usually, the quarterfinals are really tightly contested. Matches are harder to predict. So, if you load up on let's say Spain and Spain go out in the quarterfinals, and you have six players from Spain, you can still use your unlimited transfers to swap them all out before the semifinal. And Obviously, in the semifinal and the final, you have the exact same players because the semifinalists will either go to the final or the bronze final. So that's also another way of using the wild card. So I'm leaning towards using the wild card probably in the knockout stages before the quarterfinal, but there's plenty of strategies you can use here. So I don't know if that makes uh, if that reasoning uh, convinces you or not to use your wild card differently, or what do you think? No, I think uh, in terms of, I think it's just sort of depends on your team, right? Like if your team is pretty uh, hot shit in that sense, um, you might as well just save the wild card, like you said. But at the same time, if if it actually plays out the way we think it can, it seems like an ingenious thing to do for match day two. Yeah. Whatever you know bunch of players that didn't work out you swap them out and you know you get the points of the other players and etc and then you just switch back and forth whoever you want again it seems like such an ingenious move to do for a match like it's a bit boring that you, you then have such a fixed um thing but at the same time yeah I think it seems like the uh, optimal way to use it it's either you do a match day two into three um, or before two into three, uh, or before two into two into three, uh, or just like you said, if you went guns blazing, I think this team's going to win, and then you screwed it up by them going out, or they screwed it up by going out. Uh, yeah, I think those two options are viable, but the one I'm probably going to lean towards is, uh, yeah, into game week two. So just to summarize, Kevin is going to blow his load early and I'm probably going to last a bit longer. But let's go on Fair to enough. the next slide. Uh, just captaincy options. We were just talking about captaincy and uh, which players you can uh, target. So I've listed here, uh, just to go through the, um, the screen you're looking at if you're watching on YouTube, uh, I have one, two, three, four, which is basically the order of which the teams play. Like I said in the beginning of this part two, uh, group A and B play together. They are in their first day of matches. And then in the second day of matches, you have group C and D with uh, some pretty pretty big teams, Argentina and France among them. Day three, you have um, Spain and Germany and some other big teams. And then day four, you have group G and H playing together. So just listing a couple of uh, captaincy options from each group in group one, where you have Netherlands, England, Senegal, Iran, USA, Wales, Ecuador, and Qatar. You have uh, Kane is the only option worth more than 9.5, which is the bolded players in the captaincy options. Yep. Uh, he's basically the main captaincy option if you want to captain someone on the first, uh, well, the first day. It's uh, it's going to be the second day technically because Qatar and Ecuador play on the Sunday, but you get the point anyway. Other options that are more well, cut price are Foden, Bergwijn, Sterling, and Dumfries, but I suggest you don't captain one of those guys early when there are so many better options later. One of them come in uh, the second day. On the Tuesday, we have uh, Argentina playing, we have France playing, we have Denmark playing, Mexico, Poland, Tunisia, Australia, and Saudi Arabia. Uh, like I mentioned previously, Messi is an obvious captaincy option here. He plays Saudi Arabia in the first match, so that makes a lot of sense. Mbappe plays Australia. That's another great captaincy option. Um, I think from the rules clarifications today, it says that you can switch your captain 
on the same day as well. So you can actually have Messi and Mbappe and switch if Messi blanks against uh, Saudi Arabia in the early match. You can swap to Mbappe who plays in the late late evening match and have Mbappe as captain instead against Australia. So that's a pretty good one to combo if you want to have like two good captaincy options. If you want to go different than an Mbappe, you could go with Benzema, who's also pretty expensive. Uh, depends. I'm not 100% sure who takes penalties out of Benzema and Mbappe. Uh, they both have been taking penalties for France, so this depends on that. If you want to go with a cheaper option from France, you can go with Griezmann. Or if you want to go with a cheaper option for Argentina, if you don't have faith in Messi for some reason, um, you can have Lautaro Martinez. If you have Messi and Martinez, obviously you should captain Messi. You can't captain one and then switch to the other because they play the same at the same time because they play in the same team so mm-hmm. pretty much and then the third day of matches or yeah, on the will be the wednesday in match day one you have uh, big teams like spain germany uh, belgium croatia morocco japan canada and costa rica are playing um but yeah i think in terms of like premium players there's only Kevin De Bruyne who's the most expensive midfielder for 11.5 for Spain and Germany you don't really have any like premium options the closest you get is Sané who's uh, 9.0 for Germany he's another captain's option the best option you have from Spain is probably Pedri or well he's at least the most expensive options option for Spain you also have uh, Morata um, as well and you also have Musiala from Germany and then on the final day of matches in match day one you have brazil portugal uruguay serbia switzerland ghana south korea and cameroon playing something notable with uh the fourth uh day of matches is that there are not any like really bad teams as you can see if you're watching on youtube we have ranked the teams from hardest to easiest the hardest teams to beat are the teams in red that's uh, six teams um so yeah basically if you didn't watch part one we did a tier list and that's what this difficulty rating is based on so in the s tier the top tier we have listed six teams that's argentina spain brazil france germany and portugal um then we have the hard difficulty fixtures which is the a tier where you have netherlands england belgium croatia and uruguay and then you have the lesser teams in the medium, easy, and uh, easiest difficulty ratings. But yeah, just to finish with the, the fourth day of matches, you have, well, a lot of premium options because there are a lot of premium options from Brazil and two premium options from Portugal as well. So in terms of players worth 9.5 or more, you have Neymar, you have Vinicius Jr., you have Cristiano Ronaldo, and you have Bruno Fernandes. And then just as another option, you have Richard Lisson. But as the final game of the match day i don't think you should captain richardson you should probably have any more if you want to captain someone but in a pinch if you have richardson and your previous captains didn't perform you can switch to him or someone else i guess so yeah um i feel like you should have out of the players in bold here that are worth 9.5 or more i feel like you should only have three at most maybe even four uh we'll see do you have uh, any obligation or any, what's the objection? I mean, do you have any objection to quote uh, Ace Attorney uh, <laughs> on that point? Uh, no, uh, I think, um, yeah, I, I think I agree with everything that was said. Uh, the only thing is that I'd make a note is potentially that yeah cristiano ronaldo no i'm just kidding no i'm just kidding no i'm just kidding i was originally gonna do this whole bit about ronaldo but essentially i agree with the point that less is more uh because if you have too many captain options and stuff like that it does make the little rest of the team worse uh because yeah yeah, you're using too much of your budget but uh at the same time i have four (laughs) people so and from every single match day or every single uh day from the match day as well so um yeah yeah i believe i'll see your team pretty soon but i think you have the top options from uh all the teams do you yeah i think yeah yeah so you have actually gone with the four 
premium yes. player, plus yeah. one 12th man. So yeah. yeah, we're gonna see how that affects the rest of your team pretty soon. Yes. But first, we're gonna go through the fixtures again. The same uh, difficulty rating applies, and uh, I've listed the fixtures on your left-hand side. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see the teams with the easiest fixtures. Uh, the two teams with the best fixtures are France and Netherlands. They both have two teams that are listed as the easiest opponent. Uh, mm -hmm. For France, that's Australia and Tunisia. They play Australia in match day one and Tunisia in match day three. For Netherlands, that's Ecuador and Qatar. They play Ecuador in match day two and Qatar in match day three. Only thing with Netherlands is that as you could, as you could see on the previous slide, they don't really have any main major options. That was one of the drawbacks we listed uh, in the tier list as well. That's why we didn't have them in the top, top tier, because they don't really have any well, standout offensive options, really. It's Memphis Depay who's been, well, their talisman, really, but he's been injured lately. It doesn't seem like he's going to start in the first match against Senegal. Other than that, you have Bergwijn and Dumfries, which are good options, but captain options maybe not so much mm -hmm. uh, but anyways you can see the best teams to target on the left and the teams on the right there are not that many teams that are interesting at least in the first uh, match day but if mm -hmm. you look at someone like uh, say Serbia they play Brazil in the first match day but after that they have Cameroon which is an easy fixture and then Switzerland which is like a medium fixture so you might uh, want to target Serbia after that because they have a really strong team with a lot of good offensive players so so yeah that's pretty much the fixture ticker are there any teams that stand out to you really no in the sense of like i think the obvious picks you know you're obviously going to have an argentinian player i think croatia would have been much higher if we if they had like a proper striker that they could rely on like if uh for example, if Mitrovic was Croatian, that would have been like super ideal and all this type of stuff. But uh, I think everyone will have someone from France. Everyone will have Dumfries, probably. Most people will have players from England, Trippier, for example. So I think like we've always been touting about the World Cup and sort of these national team things, unlike the Premier League, which feels like even though like for example city and arsenal are the teams to go for because they're so much a cut above everyone else this is even more so there are teams that are just a cut above so just load up on those players portugal brazil spain germany argentina belgium england netherlands france like these are the teams we've you know in the even on the tier list we went like yeah we're gonna go far I think um, I think Uruguay is one of those teams that people are sleeping on a little bit because mm -hmm. I think Valverde has honestly, if like I don't think I think people are taking the piss if I'm completely honest if they're trying to insinuate that he's better than Kevin De Bruyne, but I think in terms of form and everything that he's going through right now, he is easily like top three mid center mids in the world right now. So mm -hmm. I think there are going to be some sleeper teams and i think uruguay is one of the ones that people should keep an eye out for however we have to wait and see because they for me they're that group is such a difficult one to call like i think portugal should come you know first or second and i feel that uruguay should do it too but korea we've seen have beaten germany just in 2018 and now with Son potentially being back and everything could look different. And especially with um, the Napoli center back, uh, Jay being, you know, a force to be reckoned with. Ghana are so talented, such a high ceiling, but the cohesive nature could be a complete backfire. But yeah, it, it's going to be difficult to see basically if Uruguay can go all the way but i still but i still think personally that they're going to come first in the group i that's what i predicted so i think that's another team that you should look out for Lewandowski obviously has good games as well and i think he's one of the strikers that people are sleeping on as well because mm -hmm. yes he's facing mexico but then after that super easy match in match so day great. two okay. and then Obviously, Argentina, I think things might go south for them there. But uh, 
yeah, I think Argentina um, might be through at that point as well. So yeah, exactly. And I think the most important thing to look out for is that if you have a bunch of these premium guys and for whatever reason they get injured, look at the right hand column and see if there's matches on the second match day that work good for you. Yeah, for sure. And uh, speaking of Lewandowski and the second match day, like you mentioned, he has a really easy fixture against uh, Saudi Arabia. And what I also note from this uh, fixture ticker is that none of the other like huge teams, like you say France, um, Argentina, all those teams, Spain and Germany play each other. They yeah. usually have really difficult matches. I mean, you have Netherlands, but like I said earlier, they don't really have many captaincy options. Um, I think if you look at Portugal, have Uruguay, like most of the big teams have a difficult fixture in match day two. So that's where yeah. I think Lewandowski might be handy. I think he might be a really popular match day two pick because he plays yeah. Saudi Arabia. So he's one of the best captain options in match day two, especially if Argentina just trash Saudi Arabia in the first uh, match day. Yeah, uh, I think that would be make a lot of sense for a transfer, uh, getting Lewandowski in. And then you can just sub him out against uh, Argentina again if you want to. Especially if you do the wild card uh, tactic that we mentioned earlier with the uh, match yeah. day two, so that's the that's the only thing. Like, there, it's hard to see which match day two fixture uh, you should target for captaincy, uh, apart from Lewandowski, really. So, I think he's a really good option um, in match day two. Uh, match day one, Mexico, maybe not. He hasn't really performed that well for Poland, uh, mm-hmm. but we all we both know how how talented he is. He's one of the best strikers of all time. So. Yeah. He's definitely a good option. I don't know if there's any other match day two or even match day three if you want to go further ahead. Uh op- captaincy options you you can pinpoint. Um I mean I'm just looking just looking through all of them. I think in terms of France against Tunisia, you obviously have Mbappe again because if yeah. I feel that if you have um if you are, for example, one of these guys who have Mbappe from match day one rather than I, mean, I don't want to spoil too much but basically if you have him in your match in your current team and he's going to play Denmark you could easily just swap him down to Lewandowski for mm-hmm. that game um, but back to the point of the, the match day three matches I think um Potentially, you could look at a Danish player. You could look at Cristiano Ronaldo against South Korea as well, because yeah. I think be at that point match. it might be his final match. Or rather, that that if he, um, uh, God forbid, if he's had a good World Cup so far, he's the type of player who'd want to play the final game rather than getting rested. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I think that's a good shout. I think. Um, you know, I think um, potentially uh, if Germany win their first game against Japan, get a good result against Spain, I think easily there's a captaincy choice there with the, the match against Costa Rica. Um, yep. So, yeah, uh, I, I think the, I would have said Sadio Mane against uh, Ecuador as well, but uh, sadly he's out. Obviously, if Memphis Depay is going crazy or there is a striker or Bergwijn's going crazy mm-hmm. Netherlands against Qatar just load up on players yeah what unless about, a bunch what about unless, for match day two for match day two um I think apart from Australia no I'm just kidding uh, not Australia um <laughs> maybe you, if Tim you Kale. have you have Belgium against Morocco which is a decent match yeah. for De Bruyne yeah, yeah. Or the yeah. Kaku. I if think the, if the cock is back, that might be a good match for him as well. I think England, you would say you would still give yeah. Harry Kane and England the uh, benefit of the doubt. Netherlands, Ecuador, uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, oh, especially if, if we have if he's back. Yeah, if the pie is back, or if Bergwijn is, you know, just sets the ground running. You know, yeah. I think that's a good shout. I think um, if Brazil. You know, manage Serbia with no problem. I think Neymar, all those guys against Switzerland. I don't think Switzerland is going to be necessarily the easiest game, especially with Jan Sommer and goal. Uh, but I do think that that's not the worst game. I also think um, 
potentially, and this is going to sound wild, Hyungmin Son against Ghana could be also a good one. Yeah, assuming he is fit to play. That yes, be of a, course. That should be a decent match for him. So yeah, there are definitely some options, but I think match day three looks a lot stronger than match day two. Uh, match day one as well looks a lot stronger yeah. than match day two. So yeah. captaincy in match day two, I feel like, will be pretty vital. So maybe yeah. maybe you should use the power captain then, but then you'd lose the advantage of the wild card. But maybe that's uh, that's something for me to use power captain in match day two if I want to save the wild card yeah. until the quarterfinals. So yeah. It's plenty of uh, different tactics you can have, uh, but the most important thing uh, in any fantasy game is the team that you start with, and that's what we're going to look at now. Mm-hmm. This is my match day one squad. As of now, I haven't yet used the twelfth man chip. Um, I might still do it. I might do it to bring in Neymar. That's one of my options. I like I said previously, I I'm leaning towards having Mbappe just in the full squad in general and have him as a captaincy option against Australia. I feel like that's a huge potential match for him as a captain. And uh, assuming most other people will use him as a 12th man, they won't captain him. So I might get a huge advantage there. Um, like we've seen with Holland in um, Fancy Premier League, having him as captain is so much better than just having him. And that could be the same case for Mbappe. Um, and obviously France play after Argentina so if Messi gets like one goal gets seven points everyone else has him captain and don't want to switch to well they don't have anyone to switch to maybe they used Kane as captain in the first match day and then or the first match and then they swap to Messi and they can't switch then I'd have an advantage if Messi fails I have Mbappe as a fail safe obviously I also have De Bruyne uh, as well if Messi doesn't perform so that means I could sell Mbappe and get Neymar just in my full squad. That's also an option, but that's uh, that's about it for the tactics. I'm just going to go through the team uh, in case you're not watching. Uh, in goal, I have Palsvier, who it's the Dutch goalkeeper. We don't know if it's going to be Palsvier or if it's going to be someone else. Uh, we'll discuss that more when it comes to Kevin's team because he has picked the other potential starter. But I'm pretty sure, and Kevin is pretty sure, that Dumfries is going to be the starting right back for them assuming he's healthy and i think he said so himself he's uh, fit and ready to go he's going to be a great option against senegal in the first match Trippier, it's been in my team the whole uh, season in fpl and he's going to be in my team as long as england are in the world cup i think in the uh, fantasy world cup he's going to be the starting right back right wing back most likely maybe they'll play him at right center back with trent alexander arnold at right wing back if that's the case, I might have to change it, but most likely it's going to be either a right back in a back four or the right wing back. So he's a great option. Joachim Mele, Danish player against Tunisia. Perfect match for the left back from Atalanta. He was amazing in Euros fantasy, so it makes a lot of sense. I have a bit of a punt, sort of, uh, in um, Borna Sosa for Croatia. He's only 3.5 because um, there's still a bit of uncertainty if he starts for Croatia or if... Um, Borisic plays for Croatia, the Rangers fullback. But Sosa has been uh, really good in the Bundesliga in terms of getting uh, assists and goals. He's, he goes forward quite a lot. So if he's a starter for 3.5 for a pretty good Croatia team, he's a steal. So I'm just going to hope that he starts for them and, and have him in my squad. It feels like too much of a risk to not have him, considering a lot of other managers have him uh, from the content creators that I've watched at least. In midfield, I have uh, Bergwijn. He's uh, He didn't really perform that well for Spurs, but for Netherlands, he's been really good. He's going to play up front for the Netherlands, even though he's listed as a midfielder. For 7.0, I think it's just pretty much a no-brainer, especially considering Netherlands have a really easy group. Their most difficult matches against Senegal in match day one, then match day two and match day three, they have really easy matches against Ecuador and Qatar. So uh, he makes a lot of sense. De Bruyne as well. The only premium midfielder, really, apart from Fernandez, is 9.5. Um, he was like slightly more of a lucrative option when they had the key passes rule, because he's one of the guys who might get key passes. Uh, but now that the key pass rule is gone, he's not as interesting. And like I did, said in the group predictions, I have Belgium finishing second uh, in their group. So I don't have as much faith in them as, as I probably should have. Uh, they're in the same group as uh, Croatia. Croatia are going through as a uh, group winner. Uh, and they might even go out because they're a bit of an aging squad, but De Bruyne is still top class, of course. 
Then I have Musiala from Germany. He is uh, he's been amazing this season for uh, Bayern Munich. He hasn't had the same amount of uh, goals and assists for Germany, but I think this is his breakthrough moment. I think he he's gonna cement himself as a top ten player in the world. I'm a huge fan of Musiala, so I just feel like I have to have him in in my squad. If he doesn't start for Germany, I have 1.5 million in the bank, so I can easily upgrade him to Sané. If the um, lineups come out and he's benched, I can just go to Sané or even go to like a Brazilian or Uruguayan midfielder or something as well. So I have a decent backup option there. Messi, he's my uh, captain. He's going to be the captain for my first match. I'm probably not going to bring in Harry Kane, so Messi will be my first captaincy option. Enough said about Messi, really. He's still, well, he's always going to be the greatest of all time, in my eyes at least. And you can make the case that he's the best player in the world at the moment as well. So uh, I have Ferran Torres from Spain. He plays Costa Rica in the first match. I feel like that's a really good uh, match to target. Uh, you can even go with someone like Pablo Sarabia if he starts uh, in midfield as well. Uh, but I feel like Ferran Torres for 7 million, really good cut price option. Uh, for a striker you could also go Murata for a million more for 8 million but again <clears throat> I could also change depending on the lineup if Ansu Fati plays maybe I'll get him instead and finally in my starting 11 I have Kylian Mbappe I mentioned earlier I want to captain him against Australia that's why I have him already if he's not in my um, match day one squad he's going to be my 12th man so I'll have him either way against Australia on the bench, I have uh, the starting goalkeeper for Uruguay, Roche, who uh, until recently Muslera was the number one for Uruguay. But as Kevin uh, gladly knows, Muslera has been uh, finally been benched, and Roche was playing pretty much every match for Uruguay in 2022 uh, so far. So he's going to be the starting goalkeeper for only 4.0, which is a really good price. So I have him as an option, even if uh, Pasvera doesn't start or if, yeah. It depends what happens with the goalkeepers, but regardless, I'll have the Uruguayan goalkeeper as a backup against South Korea, potentially without Hung Min Som, so I feel that's a great option. Uh, another guy on my bench who will likely come in for Sosa, should Sosa not start, or should Sosa blank, or anyone else blank for that matter. Um, I have uh, Pavard for France, right back. I'm still considering whether to have Pavard or Theo Hernandez, I just feel like Pavard is slightly more nailed. Then again, Teronandes, because the, the game was kind of a mess. Teronandes was only, was only recently added to the game, so he's much less highly owned than um, Pavard. So i got to make a decision between those two there. I also have Trossard, who... Well, actually, I actually did like another draft after this where I swapped out Trossard for um, Kostic from Serbia because Hazard played for Belgium today, Friday and he's going to be the starter he's the captain for Belgium so I don't think Trossard is going to play but if Hazard just all of a sudden gets an injury you never know that happens with him I'll have Trossard to come in uh, if, 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 if I want him if he starts for Belgium he's a great option for 5.5 finally I have uh, one more joker option from uh, Uruguay that's uh, Georgian de Arasqueta he plays for Flamengo in Brazil so most people haven't really heard of him but he's a really tricky fun player to watch so I feel like he could do pretty well against Korea as well. So that's my whole team. My plan is still to have Messi as the first captain. And if Messi fails, I'll have Mbappe as the second captain. So that's pretty much my squad. I feel like it's pretty balanced. I have three heavy hitters, Messi, De Bruyne, and Mbappe. So I feel like I'm pretty well set for match day one, especially if I do um, Neymar as the 12th man as well. Uh, do you have any comments on my team, Kevin? Yeah, I think uh, generally speaking, the team looks good. I think um, you could potentially uh, merge Trossard and the Uruguayan midfielder into like a Esco Wilson or something like that. Um, because I think um, we're not 100% sure whether Trossard will get the required minutes to make the damage that we know that he can um and i also think that there are just a lot of decent six to eight million midfielders that can start will explode for points and stuff like that so i think that's maybe 
the one thing I would do. But if you're looking for cohesion and uh, the sense of um, uh, depth, I think this is the right play. Uh, but you'll notice when you see my team, it's less depth, more explosion anyway. Yeah. So, And that just sort of sums, up, sums the two of us up in terms of how we play fancy anyways. Definitely, I was about to say, I'm usually more the type that wants backup options, players to come in if my main guys fail and all that stuff while you are more top heavy as we'll see with your team but yeah like i said trossard is uh pretty much already out of my team uh considering hazard started today. yeah yeah so yeah whether i go with skov olsen who's uh, a decent player you'll talk more about soon i'm pretty sure yeah uh, or if i go with kostic kostic they have the, t- yeah. the the thing with kostic or any serbian player is that they have brazil in the first match so Mm-hmm. But at the same time, the bench options are just backup options. Hopefully, Correct. my whole starting 11 is just amazing, so I don't have to use any of my bench options. Or Correct. potentially just have to use Pavard for one of them. So yeah. ideally, if you want to win the whole thing, <laughs> you'd want all your starters to to, to do well perform. anyway, yeah. to perform. So that might be your thinking. That's more all or nothing if you look at your team, which has more of a superstar feel to it uh, yeah. if you go through your team so yeah you could just go through your team one by one and i'll comment afterwards yeah sure so in goal i have no pair uh, again we don't know if it's going to be pass sphere or no pair starting a lot of new um sort of suggestions and predictions uh, from journalists and experts and stuff like that has said that no bird will start so mm-hmm. for that reason and because Mane is not playing uh I will start with him and if things go to hell I can always just switch to my backup goalkeeper which is uh Roche Rochet um who is Uruguay's goalkeeper in defense I uh currently starting a five you know, five man defense which I would never do normally but here we are uh I have Dumfries who everyone has Kieran Trippier, who everyone has. Mela, who everyone has. <laughs> Sosa, which most people have as well. Unless there's, you know, uh, conflicting sort of messages about uh, whether it's him or the Rangers left back. And I have Theo Hernandez in hopes that Lucas doesn't play um, over him because I think Theo Hernandez is a thousand times better than his brother. Not to say that his brother isn't good. He's a really good defender, but Theo Hernandez just has an X factor about him that he's always had. But in classic Real Madrid um, fashion, they get rid of good fullbacks and kept a bunch of old guys. Uh, in midfield, I have uh, Bergwijn, who will be playing more as a forward anyways, who I think is a steal at 7.0. I have Sané over Musiala. My only reasoning with that is that Hansi Flick loves Thomas Miller it's the same position as Thomas Miller. Whether he goes with seniority or form, if he goes by form, he should 100% start Musiala, who's one of the best uh, youngsters, if not best players in the world right now. He's very exciting, very good, and England are probably pissed off that he didn't pick England in the end because that is the sort of player England needs right now mm. as well. But I've gone with Sané because of his good season with Bayern, his good season with germany as well in friendlies and stuff like that his name keeps coming up he takes set pieces because uh, uh as i mistakenly said once in during one of the recordings i don't even know if it made the final cut or if it was one of the scrapped ones i said tony cruz might still be on uh set pieces but tony cruz is retired so sani will be taking a lot of these free retired, kicks retired on the national team should be no yes 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 <laughs> retired from the national team uh sani uh scores a lot of free kicks takes a lot of set pieces generally speaking so i think sane musiala i think both could explode i think it's just for me sane i know for sure will be starting at that right wing position um so that's why i've gone with sane the Bruyne. everyone has the Bruyne. we all know that he's good ever since the 2014 world cup fantasy and and just fantasy Premier League. We all know De Bruyne, what De Bruyne can do. Uh, Lukaku's out as well, so that's not going to sort of take away from De Bruyne's points, if anything. It's going to add more points for De Bruyne because he'll be trying to do a lot more. I feel, I feel Not to say that De Bruyne and Lukaku... Yeah, 
and not to say that De Bruyne, De Bruyne and Lukaku can't play together. If anything, they play really well together. It's just a shame that Lukaku's injured, but you have to have De Bruyne. Um, and my forward is Harry Kane. I think Harry Kane is always up there for golden boot. I think um, he is England's only reference for attack. Like if Harry Kane doesn't score, they basically screwed. Uh, Sterling has been really hit and miss this season, but if he can sort of bring that up, it'll be fine. But Harry Kane's the type of player who's perfect for fantasy, especially with this new edition of winning penalties. Cause Harry Kane mm. literally gets touched on the back of his shoulder and he'll flop like crazy. So um, yeah, I think Harry Kane against Iran who are so defensively sound might not be the best, but that's where I think that there might be a lapse uh, in something because I think Harry Kane will just start shooting from distance, which he's really good at. And I also think that if they give away a penalty, you can bank a Harry Kane uh, goal from that. Uh, then I also have Messi. He's the greatest player of all time. He's my favorite player ever. Uh, I want him to do really well in this World Cup. I captained him all, every game I could in the previous World Cup, even though things didn't go too well. Uh, I love Messi. I saw him play against Italy in the Finalissima only a couple months ago. Looked sharp as ever. Looked really sharp for PSG. Everyone else is going to captain him. And um, to all the idiots who thinks that Messi needs the World Cup to become the GOAT, Newsflash, asshole. He is the GOAT. Um, and when it comes to my bench, I have Roche, which I mentioned earlier, um, who I think is just a solid goalkeeper. He's done really well with Nacional as well and won the league title with uh, Luis Suarez, which was fun for him. And Luis Suarez is one of my uh, favorite players as well. So it's just fun to have him on the team finally because uh, I hate Muslera more than most goalkeepers it includes goalkeepers who have actually played for my various teams that I support, including Swedish goalkeepers who have always been terrible for the longest of times. Um, but yeah, it's just fun to have him there. He's a good backup option. Um, just anyways, at 4.0 as um, not the best season for Ren, but we know that world cup is the place that all of these players sort of show up and, do absolutely wonders and then are terrible for their national uh, club teams like uh, Jeremy Doku uh, for, for Belgium uh, not too long ago. Um, then we have uh, Wahabi Kazri. Uh, he's one of those guys who just randomly turns up and a 4.5 as just the option for the bench and is a starter, takes all their set pieces, penalties, everything. I think it's just such a no brainer. He's more of a, like a winger striker sort of position anyways so i think yeah i think it's just the perfect mix neymar is obviously starting in that sense like i'm always gonna sub neymar on i have neymar for that reason but Mm. this is the team that's set up uh based on who's gonna play in which match um which first couple of days of the match day um but yeah neymar is obviously gonna come out against serbia He's going to make a lot of people regret not having him or uh, doing the chip for uh, because this he has claimed this to be his final World Cup. This is his swan song. And I love, I personally love him. I can't believe I say that because I hate every single step of the PSG move and everything that went through it. But despite all that, for me, Yes, the Champions League silverware didn't come post-Barcelona. But had he been at any other club than PSG, it probably would have. And he did get unlucky against Bayern as well. I think Neymar, historically, is going to be that sort of step right before Messi and Ronaldo. And actually a step above a bunch of the current guys as well he might have been unlucky with injuries controversies and stuff like that but the stats don't lie he's just been phenomenal throughout and uh, i wish him the best of luck for the tournament as well i think 
if there's any silverware because he you know he missed out on the Copa America the year they won he lost to Messi just recently as well if this is how he bows out from Brazil as well because he said that this could potentially be his final World Cup and potentially final few um, matches for Brazil as well what a way to do it yep there's one more guy though that you haven't mentioned it's your 12th man yeah 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 uh, i think uh it's pretty crazy to uh to blow your load as uh, matthias eloquently said uh but yeah i'm going to be doing the 12th man with mbappe against australia i i'm already regretting not having mbappe over kane because i'm it's kane that's making me iffy more than mbappe but considering what matthias already said i already have so many other captain choices I feel fine having Mbappe as a 12th man instead. Yeah. So, and I think he's the perfect shout because next week against Denmark, I probably wouldn't have kept him. Yeah, that's fair enough. Um, I'm going to touch on the captaincy thing uh, pretty soon. I'm just going to take make a few notes about your team. Basically, you have the same defense as me, except that you have uh, Hernandez rather than Palvard. So it's pretty much the same defenders and they're all really good options, obviously. <laughs> I think I think so. Oh. On the point of Sané versus Musiala, you brought up that Miller might start and that he's a favorite of Hansi Flick. Definitely an option. Um, personally, if I was the Germany coach, I'd probably play Miller as a striker rather than Havertz and then play Sané, Musiala and Aubrey behind him and basically yeah. have Miller as a false nine and have the three players behind him score and assist and uh, do a lot of damage offensively. But most likely Havertz is going to be a starting striker, so it just depends if Musiala or Miller is preferred. Um, but yeah, Sané is definitely a good sh- good shout. He's all- also on uh, set pieces, like you said. Uh, Tony Cruz is not there anymore. He retired from the national team. So Sané is an amazing option that I'm considering as well. Um, other than that, you have Kane, who I don't have. Um, he's, like you said, Kane is England's main option. He, you made a really good case for him in terms of uh, winning the penalties. He can win a penalty. He can score the penalty. He can have another shot on target and get a bonus point that way so he's probably the one that gains the most from the extra categories in terms of uh, shots on target and winning the penalty on top of scoring it so he's definitely a great option uh it's just personally i wouldn't captain him so i'm just staying away from him i feel like the other captaincy options you have uh including mbappe as your 12th man mbappe messi de bruyne and neymar i feel like they're just a little bit better. They play for better teams. Uh, well, maybe not the Bruyne. Belgium are on par with England, just about. But yeah. So I, I guess it's it's a matter of the Bruyne or Kane, maybe. But like I said, the Bruyne is such a nailed player. He's so amazing for Belgium and for everyone, really. So. Uh, so yeah, um, I also appreciate that you have uh, Solimana. He's one of my favorite up and coming players. I don't think you mentioned his price, but he's 4.0, so he's the cheapest yeah. midfielder you can get. So, assuming he starts for Ghana, it's it depends. They've gotten a lot of new players uh, in Ghana. It, uh, Inyaki Williams and uh, well, Lamptey and stuff, and Salisu play defensively, but still. Uh, it's just a matter of if Sol- Solomana plays or not. But he's your bench option, so hopefully for you, you don't, you don't have to use him. Your only bench option that you have to use is Neymar. So, one of the players you have starting We'll probably blank at least one of them so you'll have neymar for that uh so yeah you have a pretty well top heavy team but i feel like none of the starting players except for maybe salsa considering melee plays against tunisia apart from salsa who's a bit of a wild card i feel like all your starting players are legit starting players even though you have uh cheaper options and uh and the premium heavy hitters so I feel like you're in a pretty good spot. It's just one question that I have is what are your plans for captaincy? You're obviously captaining Messi and Saudi Arabia, but if Messi, say he gets seven points, if he scores a goal, that's it. Mm-hmm. What will you do with captaincy? Will you switch it to De Bruyne? Will you switch it to Neymar? You only have one captaincy switch, or will you even captain Kane first and then switch to Messi? That That is, uh, that is the forever question, right? Um, I think... For me, personally, it's it's a luxury problem to have, to be completely honest. I feel that if Messi blanks, no, sorry, let me put it this way. If Kane blanks, 
I feel that Messi will get at least a goal and I'll be happy with that because a lot of people might switch from Messi to someone else who then flops. For example, Mbappe. Mm -hmm. Mbappe might screw things up for a lot of people in that regards and a lot of these other guys as well. So I feel that I, f- but like it's Messi's gonna get like a brace and like yeah. two assists. Like you can already tell. Like I don't know. There's just it's the fact that Messi didn't even take the uh, friendly match that seriously and got a goal and assist. And like the guy is the team is so beautifully built around him and his prowess, and they all fight for each other. And Scaloni, just generally speaking, is a amazing manager like i'm actually quite surprised that no club teams have been trying to get him like i mean god forbid anything happens with xavi but if this is another way to entice messi to come back sort of thing it wouldn't hate it but obviously i'm team xavi all the way um but but you get what i mean like i think argentina are looking so so good I think Brazil are looking so, so good. So maybe my options might be Messi and maybe sit on it and then go for Neymar. Yep. But I think my options currently is going to be Messi and then someone else. Yeah. I could go with Kane because the more I think about it, the more stupid points I can see Kane getting because AE strikers get the same amount of points as midfielders so having a premium strike force is worth it and that's why i'm playing four strikers this first game week in that yeah. regards so for me maybe maybe i might risk it with kane against iran maybe maybe my question yeah. if you do that tactic uh, tactic of doing kane first my question yeah. my question is then how many points Will Kane have to score for you not to, for you a brace. Not to switch to Messi? A bear brace or hat trick? If he gets a brace, then I won't change it. So um, Genuinely. how many points is that? 12? 11? 10? Uh, yeah. What, so what's, he... your, what's your limit for when you when you don't want to switch to Messi? Because obviously everyone else will have Captain Messi. So... Yeah. Listen, if Harry Kane can get me a hat trick, then uh, he'll stay as captain. <laughs> no, but like if, if he gets... If I can get a between 13 to 15 point return with him. So either 26 to 30, I'll probably keep him. <laughs> okay. But for, for, with that point but alone, he, just that point alone makes me think that you should probably not Captain Kane. Cause, I know. Cause, I know. But <laughs> if I have Kane in my team, he has to be doing this type of uh, performances yeah. anyways. But I mean, the thing, with, uh, the thing with Kane is that he has three matches that are of similar difficulty like he yeah. doesn't have any difficult matches but he doesn't have any yeah. like, super easy matches either so i think you can easily just have kane and not captain him and then switch to neymar but fair then enough again, then again it's it's just because i know you're such a big fan of messi and you you're, you're only going to keep it on kane if he has like 15 points well he could get 15 points against iran who knows but yeah. southgate in england i don't know three nil against i iran. i i don't know i don't think that's gonna happen i personally think it'll yeah. be a 2 no win if they do win it. Um, but yeah, if that um, that being said, like, I don't think it's the worst thing in the world to skip Kane, Captain Messi, and then if Messi blanks, I have a crazy amount of players that I can pick yeah, for captaincy. Definitely. So, so I could just I could just save it, and I probably will, and I probably I mean as you see in the picture i have so yeah it just all depends on for me it just all depends on sort of what the feelings like i think a lot can change between uh ecuador qatar that will sort of set the stage and everything like that to how i end up doing um with kane and everything like that if kane is like tweet something like i'm feeling good i might okay <laughs> captain or you know um, but yeah, I think that's the fun thing about this, that the first game will set the stage for a lot of how we'll do our transfers anyways. Because if Kane sucks, he's my he's the one I replace for uh, Lewandowski, for example. Yep. I don't have Mbappe for next week anyways, yep. so, so I don't have that uh, worry in that regards. But if he gets a hat-trick, then I'll keep it Kane, and then that becomes a 
a whole issue on its own because then I can't even 12th man Lewandowski in. Sure enough. So, Hurricane, if you're listening, tweet out, I feel good, and <laughs> Kevin will look happy. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. sure he's listening, 100%. and I'm sure he's going to oh, yeah. make sure to tweet that. So, you have to. He tweets that. random crap like that all the time. <laughs> so, yeah. Potentially. Yeah. But, yeah, uh, I had one final point I was going to make before we go to the outro, but I don't think. Well, yeah, it was just this point about Messi. Um, both of us are huge fans of Messi. Obviously, we want him to do well against uh, Saudi Arabia. Personally, I want him to score five goals and potentially get the most goals in World Cup history. <laughs> it's pretty far away from that, but five goals against Saudi Arabia would help. <clears throat> but at the same time, as a fantasy player, the best option is probably for Messi not to score that much. So you can have a differential captain. That's like if I have Mbappe as captain and no one else has him as captain, I'm going to gain a lot compared to if I have Messi as captain, he scored five goals and everyone else has him as captain. So in terms of fantasy, you kind of want to see Messi do not so well if your other cap if your next captain does well but we both want him to score so hopefully he's our captain and he scores a hat trick or more so that's the final thing i'm going to say on uh, well each of our teams are going to move on to the outro this is the end of the podcast i hope you've gotten a lot of information about the world cup fantasy game um a lot of you guys listening know a lot about fpl i'm sure not as many people know that much about the world cup and all the different teams and stuff so i hope you can give us a like if you had gotten any information that you didn't know about from before uh clarifying the rules is also nice i think we'll be well i'll post this tomorrow on saturday um so we'll be one of the first people to talk about the rule changes i guess um anyways but as far as other things social media i'll just send it over to you kevin to wrap this whole thing up uh just the final thing before i leave it the, the floor to you is just that uh, you can join our mini league uh the league code is rb73 auts and you can also search for the fpl scope in uh, the leagues and find us there as well if you for some reason don't like putting in league codes so kevin you can uh, talk us through all the different platforms you can reach us on including twitter which is still here at the moment, but we'll see how long that lasts. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, just keep an eye out for us on all platforms, including Twitter, where we'll uh, do some fun uh, polls and all this type of stuff. And uh, obviously we'll be interacting more with the different national teams and all and players throughout the world cup and leaving comments and stuff like that and trying to, um, rise or rouse an interaction out of them and also um all of you guys i'm sure there's going to be some controversial takes just from everyone left and right considering it's a controversial world cup as it is um but we'll make sure to have some fun content across twitter instagram uh for some polls and some quotes and etc from the various players and we'll obviously do some fpl related content throughout the world cup because we're obviously going to focus on some of the premier league players and how they're performing during the world cup obviously the biggest uh guy in the planet and all this type of stuff erling brown holland isn't going to be there but there's still plenty of people uh to keep tabs on you can still find us on spotify as always itunes there's been a little bit of a delay with the verification but that should be out very soon as well please make sure to join us in the mini leagues as you can see on screen uh and uh yeah uh, all i can say is take care hope uh, if your team is playing at the world cup i hope they have a good world cup obviously sweden and norway didn't make it uh, this year so we'll be watching as neutrals and we're not we're not neutral at all we want Messi to win yeah. uh, so uh, you know vamos Argentina and um, yeah uh, best of luck with everyone hope everyone who is attending and uh, goes there has a fun safe time and uh, yeah uh, I haven't been hyped for the World Cup at all uh, despite you know it being Messi's you know final chance of winning it and all this type of stuff because of everything that's going on there but at the same time, the closer I get to it, the closer I get to see Messi put on that jersey again, Neymar, all of these guys, and getting to see the points come in, I'm sure the excitement levels will go up, and I'm sure 
you guys will join us in that journey too. So uh, thanks in advance. See you guys out there and uh, good luck and have a good World Cup. Yeah, there's just one final thing that you reminded me of talking about future FPL content and stuff. I'm going to be making a review of my uh, of the start of FPL this season. Give me 1 through 16, go through all the teams. Kevin potentially will do the same. Kimo, our third member of uh, the FPL Scope podcast. He's in Egypt on vacation, so he's not going to be doing that. He'll join us for the Premier League restart, which will be uh, late December. Uh, or even, well, he's in Egypt until after the new year, so he might join us in game week 19 but we'll see we'll, we'll see when we get there but as far as uh, world cup fantasy content goes me and kevin will go through all the match days and all the um, knockout stages together uh, the next time we'll um, record is on uh, wednesday this coming wednesday uh, that will be in the middle of match day one so we'll know by then if messi has uh, been super good or if he only got one goal so yeah, we'll give you an update there. That will be in the middle of the game week. So we'll look ahead to match day two, see what transfers we are planning, what we've done so far, and maybe an update on the rules if there's been any new stuff when it comes to the rules. Also, like you said, uh, if you follow us on Twitter, we'll be sure to try to retweet any like breaking news about lineups or potential starters and stuff. If there is news about who starts for Netherlands and stuff, we'll retweet that account and uh, make sure everyone sees it uh but yeah that's about it for me and for kevin so we'll just leave you there so goodbye take care see you in uh about a week bye bye